Welcome back to 12 Days in March. This is the second of a two-part presentation, reasoning through sample questions highlighting materials presented in the Pearls, Pitfalls, and Lessons Learned video series. So let's move on to our next sample question. Feel free to pause the recording while you sort this gem out. We usually start with data, but graphics are often difficult to interpret, so I like to review the stem first. That is, let's establish some pretest probabilities before attempting to interpret their graphic. Insofar as the physical exam, we see a patient with significant hypertension and a neck exam that reports jugular venous distension. Ding, 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 ding. This is a key physical exam finding. The question writer has just told you the patient has an elevation of the central venous pressure. We now know the patient has a cardiovascular etiology for their presentation. Working our way through the physical exam, we see the lungs are described as clear as in no Rawls. But there are also decreased breath sounds as seen in COPD. Percussion is not described, so I am not worrying about an effusion or pneumothorax. On the cardiac exam, we once again see the description of a diastolic heart sound, not a murmur. This is the language of an S3 or S4, and in this instance, since the patient is a poorly controlled hypertensive, it is likely that it represents an S4. And finally, we see evidence of ascites and peripheral edema, both of which must be on a hydrostatic basis, given the presence of jugular venous distension. And with that, we can circle back to the answer options. So the JVD alone leaves us with only the first three disorders as viable answer options as portal hypertension and ovarian carcinoma wouldn't be associated with an elevation of the jugular venous pressure. But as I remind you, if you work back from the options, you would find abdominal distension, a fluid wave, and edema, and think that portal hypertension and ovarian carcinoma were viable answer options. But if you keep your focus on the stem and work down to the options, the JVD excludes both these. I harp on this as students who stare at enough options begin to hallucinate. I already said this, but I love mushrooms, but just the regular kind. So here are our viable answer options, and now we can plug in our typical descriptors focusing on the physical exam. For corporal monali, we'd expect JVD and edema on a hydrostatic basis as described in our stem. The lung findings would vary based on the etiology. For instance, if the patient has corporal monali secondary to pulmonary vascular disease, the lung exam would be normal. If it is secondary to interstitial lung disease, you would expect to find fine Velcro-like crackles. In this case, there were decreased breath sounds consistent with the diagnosis of COPD. And just a reminder, not to forget a loud P2 would be a pathognomonic finding for pulmonary hypertension if it was included in the question stem. Insofar as constricted pericarditis, you might expect the presence of Kussmaul sign and or a pericardial knock in addition to hydrostatic edema. Neither of these are described in the question stem. And finally, LV failure will be typically described with an S3 in Rawls. An S4 might be included if the patient suffers from diastolic heart failure. And to bring this question home, we need to reintroduce the graphic, which is a chest x-ray demonstrating hyperinflation with flattening of the diaphragms. So combining the graphic with the physical exam description of decreased breath sounds makes core pulmonale the most likely explanation for the clinical presentation. The vignette did not include typical descriptors for constricted pericarditis, and although the patient had hypertension and an S4, he lacked pulmonary rolls, and the x-ray did not reveal interstitial edema, so LV failure would not be most likely. In this instance, the hypertension in S4 just represented extraneous information intended to lure you from the correct answer choice. And in case you missed it, we solved this mystery with just a focus on the physical exam and data. We didn't even need the verbiage to sort this question out. But for the record, they offered supportive clinical demographics, as well as a touch of nonsense to get you off the scent. In general, the verbiage takes on greater importance in questions lacking physical exam findings or key data. And finally, before concluding a question, be sure to refine your notes. In this instance, I updated constricted pericarditis, distilling the key NBME language into just a few sound bites. All right, one more question to go, although I could do these all day. The question writers eventually become very predictable. So take a moment to review this question, and we'll finish up this exercise. By now, you should be fairly attuned to teasing out the key facts from the useless nonsense in these vignettes. Good luck. So this question isn't too bad. We have a patient with abdominal pain and fever, followed by a nice selection of answer options. As we are now expert, let's plug in our typical associations. And as I previously mentioned, this is a quick mental exercise we would typically do after narrowing down the options. But it is also a good exercise to do while studying the Q banks. It will help cement key concepts into your mind's eye. 
So the quick months over includes acute cholecystitis that would be characterized by colicky abdominal pain, inappropriate demographic, and the diagnosis of cholecystitis would not include jaundice. I only mention that to reinforce that cholecystitis is different than cholecystitis associated with obstructive jaundice. And so far as acute pancreatitis, we'd expect to see mid-epigastric pain radiating to the back, inappropriate demographics such as alcohol or stones, and most importantly, pancreatitis questions almost always include diagnostic lab features such as elevation of the serum lipase. A gastric ulcer would also be characterized by mid-epigastric pain, but it might be described as improved with food. Similarly, there would be a demographic, usually related to non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, and the patient would be afebrile. Ischemicolitis is characterized by bloody diarrhea. There would be an appropriate demographic, such as underlying cardiovascular disease, and typically a diagnostic modality would be included, such as a CT demonstrating colitis or a colonoscopy describing segmental ischemia. And finally, hepatic vein thrombosis is characterized by ascites, hepatic tenderness and or enlargement, and diagnostic tests including elevation of the transaminases, but more typically, reversal of flow on Doppler imaging. Further, you need an appropriate demographic to include a thrombophilic state. So now we can plug in the rest of the stem. We see she is a 45-year-old woman, which is a good demographic for acute cholecystitis. We note the presence of alcohol use, which goes along with acute pancreatitis, but in acute pancreatitis, where do we expect to find the pain? Right, in the mid-epigastrium radiating through to the back. This pain is described as colicky. Further, they offer no lab confirmation, so the alcohol use is likely tomfoolery. The stem goes on to describe discomfort in the right upper quadrant, also in keeping with the diagnosis of acute cholecystitis. So based on what they told us, including colicky pain, fever, and tenderness in the right upper quadrant, and what they didn't tell us, including lack of non-steroidals, no bloody diarrhea, no thrombophilic state, no pain in the mid-epigastrium, and no data was included such as lipase or Doppler imaging. So based on what they told us and what they didn't tell us, we were able to largely deduce the correct answer of cholecystitis. But before submitting, let's sort out the graphic. Graphics can be tough. We don't always know what we're viewing, but as we went through these exercises, perusing the language of the question stem and pondering the typical associations of the answer options, we were able to establish some pretest probabilities. So as we wound down, all we needed to do was view the graphic and determine if it was consistent with our working diagnosis of acute cholecystitis and a more or less passed muster. And whereas this approach with graphics is a largely successful approach, the one place you won't get away with it is in hematology. You will need to be able to interpret the blood smear in order to negotiate your way through hematology questions, but that's a topic for another day. And with that, we've wrapped up our lessons on NBME vignettes, pearls, pitfalls, and lessons learned, hopefully underscoring a key of the few take-homes. If you have any questions or concerns, please email me at 12 days. Thank you.